Good morning, church. Good to see you. Good morning. I want to talk to the camera for a second. People in Perth, Australia that are watching right now, Pakistan that are watching right now, friends and family in Washington State that I know of that are watching. So good morning. Shade people, good morning. Sun people, good morning. Not quite sure over there. Good morning. Is it just me or does the world seem a little more tense? A little more agitated, a little more hostile, a little more antagonistic, a little more unstable, a little more confused, a little more divisive. It's amazing. Scripture says where there's envy and strife, there's every evil work present. This book we're getting into that we've been into, this letter actually, First Peter, is the perfect book for times like these. It's like if you were describing the times that we're living in right now, and you were equipping a young disciple, and you said, you know, here's the letter you want to spend a lot of time in for times like these, it would be First Peter. It's a great book because it addresses so many things. It addresses how you handle persecution, how you handle suffering, now, those aren't great topics as far as, like, the average American. The average American isn't lining up to buy, what do you, what do you buy now? Is it CDs or MP4s? or what, what, what do you buy when you buy something like that? Teaching. Huh? Apple what? Okay, sure. But nobody's scrolling like, I just need a good message on suffering. I need a good message on persecution. No, because we don't want to go there. Because in our culture, it's not positive and encouraging. And we want positive and encouraging. But Peter is going to address some weightier matters of the life that we live. He's going to challenge spiritual passivity. You know, that lull that people get into. Well, you know, it's all going to just work out however it's going to work out. That passive thing that says, you know... I'm not much of a prayer. I'll let somebody else do the praying. Or I'm not much of a giver. I'm going to let somebody else do the giving. You know, that, that passive thing. And Peter is going to cut right through the core of that. And what I love about this is that he's addressing people that have been persecuted, persecuted, that have been scattered, that have been on the run. They're referred to as sojourners and pilgrims and foreigners and aliens in a strange land. And he's addressing those people. And he... And, he doesn't even give them a hint that this is how you cope with these things. This is how you thrive in life in the midst of these things. I like that. I love that it's not survival-based, but it's how to live. It's not about just coping. And it's not even about fatalism. It's not even like, yeah, you're going to die. Then you get to go be with Jesus. No, he just paints a real accurate picture of what your life as a follower of Christ looks like. And I, like you, sometimes want to skip around hard verses, you know, verses like where Jesus says, oh yeah, you're going to be hated because of me. It's like, wow, is there another verse that's a little more comforting than that? No, you're going to be hated. And so a lot of times, you know, we'll skip over the suffering. We'll skip over the persecution. We'll skip over what it costs us. We'll skip over the denying of the self. A lot of times we'll skip over the cross. Pick up your cross and follow me, said just A lot of times we want to skip over that. Or like when, when, when Paul wrote in Philippians, Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, I don't know about you. I'm a guy. I like power. Power. Power of the resurrection. Yeah. But then right next to it, there's like a hyphen. It's that three-letter word, and the fellowship of his sufferings. A lot of people want power. They don't want to pay a price. They want this little external little power thing going, oh, the Holy Spirit doing this. But they don't want to suffer. I will tell you, biblically, the people that walk with the most power suffered the most. So this is a little prep work for your future. <laughs> Thank you. Was that Mark? I heard a woo-hoo. 
Oh, Jeff, a clone of Mark. Okay. So we've, we've got two woo-woo men in the place. Okay. Great. Now, here's the deal. Persecution for them is working from the outside, but suffering is doing a deeper work on the inside. So let's look at a right response to persecution and suffering. Since on some level, if you follow Christ, you will suffer and you will be persecuted. On some level. I don't know what level that is. But I can tell you from what I see and discern, the heat is getting turned up. It's getting turned up. So we might as well be prepared. But if you look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says this. This is the key right here. For you've been called for this purpose. Everybody loves that purpose-driven life, don't they? Pastor John talked about it last week. If you weren't here, you got to go listen to him. you got to listen to that message. We love the purpose. For this purpose, you've been called. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example of how you should follow. Okay. In his steps. He committed no sin, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile. In other words, when he was criticized, insulted, humiliated in a verbally abusive manner, he said nothing. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's the key. If you don't get anything, when you go through hardship, difficulty, trials, tribulations, persecution, and suffering. This is the key verse to suffering well. This is the key verse to sanity. This is the key verse to freedom, to keeping it all together. Right here, entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. What does that mean? Entrusting means to assign responsibility to someone. Which means if somebody's mistreating you, if somebody's hostile towards you, Option A, retaliate. Okay, and I will tell you, on some level, that would feel pretty good. On the other hand, you assign responsibility. You say, God, okay, you know me. You know what I want to do right now. You know I'm this close to a bad response. But I'm going to entrust this responsibility of this situation to you who judges righteously. See, I don't trust my judgment. I don't trust, I don't trust that I could retaliate to somebody in, in an exacting, righteous manner. I don't trust myself. But I have to trust God. He seems to know how to deal righteously. Now, I will say, seldom in my time frame. He does delay, and that's more about his long-suffering nature. So what, what did Jesus do? He kept his mouth shut and he kept his heart open. He entrusted himself. Now, I will tell you, when, when you've been around a while, you see patterns in people. You see things that happen to people. You see responses that people give in a given situation. And I can tell you hands down that in 32 years of full-time ministry, I have seen people get screwed over in business deals, okay? We'll leave it at that. I've seen one person take advantage of another person and cheat them out of a bunch of money and put a spin on it. And I know one guy that I'm thinking of right now. He got taken for 10,000 bucks by supposedly a Christian guy. And, and I know this guy, and he was big, and he played tight end for Colorado University. He was a big boy. He was a big dude. And he was going to retaliate. It was going to be game over for this guy. And you know what? The, the, the flesh part of me wanted to watch that. <clears throat> the spiritual part of me said, well, we need to pray about that. Um, <laughs> but I looked at him. I said, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you this, that if you keep your heart right, God will make it right. I don't know how and I don't know when, but if you keep your heart right, God will make it right. And he resisted the temptation to throttle this guy. He resisted the temptation to sue this guy. He resisted the temptation to slander against this guy. And then you fast forward the tape. You just watch through time what happened. And I will tell you, God took this man, gave him a business that phenomenally exceeded the $10,000 he was taking. And I've seen that. I've seen that. That's not a one-time thing. 
I've seen it in marriages. I've seen it where a husband will leave a wife. No reason. Just leave. Just leave. Kids. Wife is broken. Same speech. Give them the same speech for 32 years. I'll look at the broken person. Most of the time it's a woman. I'll say, I'm just going to tell you this. Somehow you have got to find a way to keep your heart right. If you do, God will take care of you in ways that will blow your mind. I can't tell you how many times I've said that. And I will tell you, that is true every single time. Every single time. Not 8 out of 10. Not 9 out of 10. 10 out of 10 times. If you keep your heart right, God will bring justice. He will. And it will be above all that you could ever ask or think. If we do it his way. Doing things his way solicits the favor of God. Now, let me just say this. Peter mentions nine things in the previous three chapters that are at work on the inside of all of us that actually give him the authority to say these things because he's experienced them. And, and, and you just need to understand this right now, that when hardship comes... When suffering comes, when persecution comes, it's not about how much strength you can muster up on your own in the given situation. It's how much strength you can entrust God for your life with. It, it, it's, it's, it's about a transaction. It's about a surrender. It's about a giving up your personal right. And it's inviting him. And, and Peter mentions these things that are at work right now in the body of Christ. The power of God. The great mercy of God, the faith of God, God's power, our identity, grace. This is five times in every chapter. Grace is mentioned. The divine enablement to do what you can't do on your own strength. That's grace. Because quite frankly, the things, the response to suffering and persecution, you can't do it in your own strength. A righteous response will never be done in the strength of your flesh. He says there's a living hope on the inside of us. There's a resurrection of Jesus on the inside of us. There's the spirit of God on the inside of us. Now think about this. Peter, who was the, the coward who sold Jesus out, who denied him, is now full of the spirit of God. And he's penning these words. Now think about this for a minute. Peter would take those things I just mentioned to his own death. Two years after he writes these words in these letters, he would be crucified. And wait, there's more. His wife would be crucified. His wife would be crucified first in front of him. He would watch his wife be crucified. And in her agony, Peter uttered three words to his wife. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. That's all Peter had to say because that's all that mattered at that time. And when they were done with her, they crucified him and he begged them to crucify him upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus our Lord got crucified. This is a different Peter. Have you noticed? There's been a transformation and a change. This isn't Peter living in his own strength, uttering his own words. This is a divinely enabled man. Verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Walk in agreement. Walk in unity. Be single-minded. Be sympathetic. Notice this is a state of being. This isn't like, aspire to these things, adopt these things. No, these are the people of God. These are attributes that are fixed in you of being, a way of being. Be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate. And be humble. And you know what's interesting about humility there? If you go back a couple verses, you know how the, the last couple verses end? Speaking to husbands, husbands dwell with your wives considerately, with respect, so that your prayers would not be hindered. 
Literally, in the Greek, it means so that your prayers wouldn't be cut off. Somewhere, somehow, husbands that don't treat their wives right, their prayers aren't right. Their prayers don't get answered. Because there's a lack of humility. There's a lack of respect. Husbands, love your wives. Respect your wives. Honor your wives. Consider your wives. And your prayers will be answered. See, everywhere you look, we, we see confusion, conspiracy, chaos, slander, malice, fear, strife, division, death, opportunities to be offended. You ever ask yourself, how offendable are you? I wonder if there's a little meter that we could, a little app. <laughs> you know, you just, how offendable am I? Somebody says something, that little needle. <laughs> offended. Love is not easily offended. If you're somebody that gets offended a lot, you're not walking in love. There needs to be a heart change. Love one another. Compassionate. Humble. What's the answer to this craziness that's going on in our culture right now? It's compassion. It's humility. It's being like-minded. The opposite of compassion is indifference. Compassion means to actually get into the world of somebody that's going through a lot of pain and sit there with them with a desire to remove their distress. It's not just a bummer, dude. Sucks to be you. No, that's not compassion. Compassion is I let myself, you let yourself feel the pain of someone else. Now, some of you are saying, well, I'm more cerebral. Well, that's okay. God can deal with your hard heart. He really can. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm just not, a, I'm not wired that way. That's okay. You can get rewired. You really can. Ezekiel, Ezekiel prophesied it. He said, I will take out their stony heart. Take it out and put a heart of flesh. Shade people are amening better than the sun people. Thank you, shade people. We just started to split. Well, they're not in the sun because they're weak over there. Well, they don't care. They might get skin cancer over there. Well, be of one mind, folks. Don't repay evil with evil, insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. <laughs> I call that a yeah, right verse. I mean, really? Somebody comes up, tees off on me. Goes after me, reviles me, slanders me. I'm just, bless you, brother. Bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bring it on. I'm here to bless you. <laughs> just, what? <laughs> That'll just cramp your brain up. I'm telling you. He says, but, but notice this. He says, you're called to this. It's a calling. It's not an option. And then he says, you were called to this so that you can inherit a blessing. And I'm telling you. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. And I will just tell you, I, I don't know, I don't think I'm I'm here yet. I watched a prayer gathering, and I don't even know what city it was. It was somewhere on the East Coast. And it was, uh, I think it was some Catholics. And they were just praying, man. It was quiet. And they were just praying, and they weren't loud, and they were just simple, quiet prayers. And then agitators came, and screaming and yelling and bumping into them, and, you know, had an air horn in their face, in their ear. And I'm thinking, I'm tweaking. I'm, I'm on the other side of the United States. I'm thinking, no, you don't want to know what I was thinking. Um, I was thinking that I need First Peter chapter 1, 3, verse 9. That's what I needed right here. Unbelievable. And I watched these people. They were just taking, they were just praying. They were just taking it. And I'm just thinking, how do you do that? Well, you don't do it in your own strength. I mean, this is this is supernatural stuff right here. The spirit of retaliation is the temptation. That's the solicitation to do evil. Respond in the same spirit. Peter's saying, 
react in a different spirit, and you'll get a blessing. You'll live in blessing, and you may stay out of jail. Now, let's close with this. Now, this is mind-blowing. Once again, he's talking to persecuted people. He's talking to people that have experienced suffering and lack and hardship, and he's going to tell them how to have a good life in the middle of it. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of really backwards. It's nuts. He says, he who would love life and see good days. Almost sounds a little Joel Osteen-ish. Good life, good days. He says, if you want, to li- if you want that, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip from speaking deceit. Isn't it interesting? In a few verses, it has to do with the tongue. Why? Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. The tongue, our words, are creative or destructive. It's amazing. Jesus said, here's another yeah right verse. Bless those who curse you. Oh, man. Pray for those who mistreat you. Here's the, here's the key to this right here. We think if we pray for those kind of people, they're going to change. And I will tell you, not necessarily. I will tell you, they may never change. Your heart will change. Your heart will grow. Your heart will heal if you respond right. Love this. Good life. Good days. Let them turn from evil. Let's stand up together. Turn from evil, do good. There's repentance. Let them seek peace and pursue it. Peace comes when I trust that God will make it right. Peace comes when I accept my responsibility in the relational fracture. Peace comes when I see my own sin and weakness and the goodness and mercy that God has given me in spite of myself. Seek peace and pursue it. You got to go after it. I mean, peace isn't some little picture on a Hallmark card floating down. Oh, experience a little peace. No, 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 no. It's the cessation from strife. It's tranquility in the midst of chaos. It's order in the midst of disorder. And you got to go after it. You got to go after it it, with your relationship with your kids, with your spouses, where you work, where you worship. You got to seek peace and pursue it. It's aggressive. Got to go after it. You bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. I just want to ask this really one question right here. How many would say that there is an absence of peace in your life right now? Just raise your hand. Just, I just want to see because I'm going to pray. Okay. 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 All right. Awesome. All right. So, Father, we know that the peace of God is not a concept. It's the person of Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. And so I pray for every person that raised their hand that's experiencing some disorder in their heart, in their mind, in their relationships, breaking fractures, alienation, drifting from God, overwhelmed. I pray the spirit of peace would come to them in a new way and reveal to them what they need to do what their part is, how to heal fractured relationships, the humility to repent and apologize. So I pray for every person right now. I pray your kingdom would come and your will would be done in the name of Jesus Christ. And we would contend for the faith that we have once received in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. One more time, everybody said, amen. All right, church, you have a great rest of the day, great week.